Live from San Francisco, California, it's The Cube at VMworld 2014, brought to you by VMware, Cisco, EMC, HP, and Nutanix. Hi, and we're back. This is Stu Miniman with Wikibon.org, one of the biggest infrastructure, cloud, networking, and virtualization shows. It's VMworld 2014 here in Las Vegas. Joining me for this segment is Balaji Siva Subramanian, who's the Director of Product Management with Cisco. Uh, Balaji, thank you so much for joining us. Your first time on theCUBE. That's right. Thank you very much. So, sure. great. You know, we, we always really love to be able to just dig into the conversations, talk about what's really going on, and of course, networking's been critically important, um, and, and even more so over the last couple of years uh, in the VMware ecosystem. So first of all, can you give us a little bit about what, you know, what's, what's your role at Cisco? Yeah, so I manage all the Cisco's virtual networking solutions, so that those include the Nexus 1000V, but most people know about it. Um, and then the, the newly introduced uh, Cisco uh, application virtual switch for the ACI infrastructure. Yeah, uh, you know, I, 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 how long have you been with Cisco? Um, I think overall about 12 to 14, 13 okay, years. Okay, so you know, if, if you, you know, I'm sure you have, like I have, you look at you know, networking inside virtualization, boy, it's come a long way. Yes. You know, the vSwitch has been there a long time, but when I listen to, uh, my, my friend Greg Farrow says, uh, you know, it, it might have been called a vSwitch, but boy, it really looked like a nick. Uh, from a networking standpoint. So they went to the virtual distributed switch, of course the API that allowed for the, the, the 1000V uh, allowed for a lot of growth mm -hmm. in there and yeah. you know, the, the whole, both VMware has matured, Cisco's done a lot, and everyone around that has done a lot, I'm sure you'd agree. Yeah, absolutely, I think when we started this original uh, Nexus 1000V, you know, virtualization was just starting. And people used to manage physical ports, and, and now they have lost their visibility to uh, the, the ports that the VMs connect into. They, they want to configure the QoS, the VLANs, and such things like that, and they lost visibility um, to that. And so they asked Cisco to say, you know, I used to manage, the, you, you, you know, I manage your Catalyst port at that point, and I want to manage the virtual port the same way. Uh, give me a tool to do that. And that's how the Nexus 1000 came about. Uh, you know, today we have about 10,000 customers on Nexus 1000V uh, on uh, vSphere and wow. Hyper-V. All right, so uh, yeah, lo lots I want to talk about there, but first of all, I mean, the 1000V started out only for VMware today. Right. It's a you know, multi-hypervisor environment. Bring us up to speed on the kind of the breadth of the portfolio. Yeah, so we started, um, you know, we launched actually Nexus 1000V six years ago in uh, VMworld, uh, and uh, now we, we have been shipping, obviously, for six years, and we introduced Hyper-V support in uh, last year, last June, last decade we announced Hyper-V support, um, which has been shipping for a year now. We have about 2,000 customers who are either trialing it or bought it and whatnot um, in, the, in the last year. And then we also introduced the, the KVM support as well. So KVM support has been shipping since March of uh, this year. We, we did a GA of that release um, last month uh, for Ubuntu, and we hope to get it for Red Hat as well. So it's basically, if you look at it, we are sort of following what the customers are doing. Initially it was all VMware, you know, hypervisor uh, virtualization. Now people are starting to migrate to other hypervisors. So we sort of try to follow the market. Sort all of right, thing. so when I hear KV and Ubuntu, I have to ask, is there a connection with OpenStack then as to uh, how, how this fits in? Yeah, absolutely. So the, the KVM solution is purpose built for OpenStack only. So basically we're not even selling it as a standalone, you know, we switch. That doesn't really have a lot of value. Yeah. So we have worked with the um, Ubuntu Canonical and uh, basically automated every installation of it. Um, basically, if you think about it, like there's an OBS, and then this is essentially a replacement for that um, inbuilt uh, OBS there. Um, so we automated through the Juju Charm installation that they have. And we plan to do that for the Red Hat as well. So when, when we do the installation, you know, OpenStack has been very, one of the hardest thing to install, right? And people spend days and hours and months, whatever. So we wanted to make sure that at least the, our solution is fully integrated into the overall uh, solution. Yeah, so, so you mentioned you're going to have Red Hat in the future. I mean, that, that's, that's like kind three of months, three yeah, months, yeah. So, before, so before, the, the, before the Paris summit, so we want to make for, sure that. For, uh, for, for Paris, okay, yeah, great. Right. Yeah, we were, we were at OpenStack Summit in Atlanta, and yeah. right, one of the questions is, you know, boy, how, how many different distributions do I have to integrate with? So if I get Ubuntu and I get Red Hat, you, you've got you know, a, a decent portion of, of kind of the Linux community there, but um, you know, it, it, it ends up being a lot of work for the vendors, doesn't it? I agree, so I think, uh, 
you know, right now we probably will stop with the two. You know, I know Suze has been, some people have asking for Suze, but we spent some, some time on Ubuntu because they were sort of earlier to the market and, and so there's a lot of adoption there. Um, Red Hat, obviously, most of the enterprise are looking at Red Hat, so we will do that. So yeah, we probably would not go all, all distributions. And VMware owns another distribution today, so I'm not sure uh, we can keep up with that, yeah. Yeah, uh, so you know when I look at when the 1000 uh, V first launched, it yeah. really was to help you know give a tool to those, those networking people who yeah. lost visibility in the yeah. virtual switching to allow them same tools, same things, uh, and it was a premium product. I had mm -hmm. to have you know, like Enterprise Edition on VMware, and there was a license on the Cisco side. Uh, bring us on to, up to speed is kind of what is the core value proposition of uh, you know your, your virtual switching, and you know how, what's the go to market between because you know I think Ubuntu you're not paying for that I'm assuming. Right, right, right. So. Yeah, I think if you look at the, um, on the let's talk about vSphere for a second. Yeah. Um, so we, we, we did a model like a couple of years ago, we did a freemium model, right? So we basically uh, give away the, the, the primary Nexus 1000V as a freemium essential edition, and then we, we pay for the sort of the advanced edition, which has a lot of security and a lot more scale and things like that. In the, in the OpenStack model, to your point, hey, the Ubuntu is free and everything is free, so what, what value do you really provide? Um, I think the, um, the primary thing is even though the, the OBS and things are, uh, are, are free, um, sort of there's no like really network virtualization solution. It's not like, so I think one thing we want to walk away from is, is that we're not just selling a switch, we're providing a solution. So we have, we are the first one to ship the VXLAN based overlay solution in the market. Um, so, you know, I think we, today we can support 6,000 VXLAN um, segments in our, in our single VSM controller. And we also allow VXLAN to move over from, so you can actually build a multiple VSM clusters, multiple clusters, each of 250 servers, and then have your VXLAN go between, between those clusters. So essentially you can build a, like a fairly large um, overlay solution. So that's the that's what we're paying for, not necessarily for here's a V switch and here's the so that's the difference. Yeah, that's what. It okay, so, so there actually there's a license that uh, that goes that's along right, with that. That's right. Okay. That's right. That's right. Great. Uh, you, you brought up kind of VXLAN. You know, the, the kind of overlays and underlays have been a big, you know, big discussion for the, for the last couple of years. Um, you know, how do your virtual switching products, you know, fit into that whole discussion? So I think um, if you look at it, um, you know, with our Cisco ACI uh, solution, we, our goal is to provide end-to-end -end, uh, kind of end -end, uh, solutions, right? So basically, when you create a tenant, um, it starts all the way from the virtual side. You know, you know the segmentation sort of retained over the physical side, and not only that, we provide end-to-end -end visibility and, and performance management of that. Um, so the, the our virtual switching is evolving. So with the, our ACI solution, we are integrating directly into the uh, into the off, uh, through the Offlex into the APIC, which is a, our uh, application policy infra controller. Um, so, so the overlay, you know, what we're doing essentially is tied into the physical fabric as well. So I think the uh, at the end of the day, overlay is convenient. Um, if it's just purely overlay and there's a completely uh, unrelated underlay, I think there's a, there's a problem. It's not deployable in my opinion. I mean, it's deployable obviously, but you know, will production applications be able to do it unless you get a lot of feedback back from the underlay? Mm -hmm. you, that's why I think VMware was even trying to you know, do some partnership with other vendors. But essentially, you want to have a full end-to-end -end visibility. You just don't want to just overlay and then hope that underlay works. Yeah, uh, so what about how how, uh, how the, the 1000V and everything fits into the, the whole cloud discussion? I mean, it started really kind of local, but you know, it's getting more and more distributed, and you know, that, that, I'm assuming that's part, big part of the yeah, discussion. Yeah, so well, one of the solutions we are introducing, um, it's sort of related to the N1KV technology, the same, same team is building it. Um, it is called the uh, Cisco Intercloud Fabric. So basically, you know, we are basically build, allowing customers to go to any cloud providers. So we have uh, we have announced uh, recently we are going to Amazon, Azure, or you go to BT or a, or a Porch Telecom or a Virtual Stream. So we allow that hybrid. We allow the workload to be migrated from your private cloud to any of those clouds. So some of this technology, like the VSG, the Virtual Security Gateway, the CSR, are all going to be available there. So we actually do the virtual networking similar to what we do in the private cloud. We we if you just move the workload and then you, if you don't get the same level of uh, uh, support, uh, security gateways and other things in the public cloud, you're going to be in trouble. Uh, you, you, can't, you, know, you want to be able to have the, otherwise I, won't, I don't feel comfortable going there. So with the intercloud fabric, we're essentially taking out some of our components, the VSG for example, 
into that public cloud, any public cloud. Actually. Okay, so uh, did I hear right then? Uh, do, can you, do you have hooks into Amazon then? To yeah, be, yeah, absolutely. Be able to do yeah, that? Amazon, Azure, and the BT will be live in, I think we are in beta right now, will be, I guess, uh, going live uh, in um, about a month or so. Uh, so yeah, that's the intercooler fabric. Yeah. Right. So we, Cisco has obviously invested a lot of money, uh, or investing a lot of money into building our own uh, fabric, uh, either working with our partners or ourselves, and we will also be able to ramp to that. So think of it as this product as a ramp to any services, public services. Yeah. So we, don't, we want to provide customer choice. Okay, um, so, so you said you want to give customers choice. Uh, you know, obviously since the Nicira acquisition, VMware's added a lot to their networking group. We're going to have Martine on on Wednesday. That's right. uh, talk about, you know, they, they took the OpenV switch and kind of made their own version that's inside. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how, how, how are you dealing with that? Does it have to be all Cisco or all VMware? Are there ways that they can play together? Uh, you know, and customers yeah. are kind of caught in the middle. No, yeah, this is, I wrote actually a blog about a, a couple of weeks ago yeah. on this topic, which is that, I think the because of the virtualization becoming so important, the hypervisor uh, it obviously is important. The, the virtual switch in the hypervisor becomes a control point, and if if a specific vendor kind of locks it out, um, I think it makes it difficult for customers to have a choice in the solutions. Right. The good news today is that VMware is allowing Cisco, IBM, and HP to provide uh, the vSwitch solutions. Um, you know, Hyper-V again is open and providing the different uh, vSwitches to be provided. Cisco N1KV is there as well, as well as NEC, I believe. And then obviously in the open source uh, hypervisor, either it's Zen or, or, um, or uh, KVM, you have OBS, right? So we, you know, we are contributing heavily into OBS. So as long as this choice remains open, I think we are good to go. Uh, in terms of uh, in terms of openness, in terms of uh, giving customer choices. Yeah, it's funny. I, I pulled up your blog. Oh, okay. I was looking. It looked like Juan Lodge uh, uh, yeah, had, had yeah, contributed. Yeah. We were trading that's tweets right. during the keynote this that's morning. That's right. That's right. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's interesting. I remember when the 1000 V first came out. You know, I talked. I was working for a storage company at the time. Talked to all the networking companies, and they said we're never going to create our own virtual switch because mm. you know Cisco's proprietary, even though it was an open API for the doing it. And I look at it now. You know, you listen to your blog post. You know, IBM has a virtual switch. HP has a virtual switch. Of course, VMware has what they're doing, mm -hmm. uh, NEC, mm -hmm. uh, you know, there, there's so many out there. So, you know, wouldn't it be easier if we could all just get to a single virtual switch or, you know? Yeah, so, so good question. There's two ways to do it, right? One is a native way switch provides all the uh, APIs that uh, every other solution needs. For example, you need OpenFlow for some controller which you need OpenFlow support. You need OffLex, for example, for ACI support. You know, if the native way switch Internet research provides that, I think we are okay. And you know, at the end of the day, we don't want to be saying, you know what, let's say Hyper-V for example, VM, Microsoft has said, said uh, publicly as well, that they're going to implement OffLex on, uh, on their Hyper-V vSwitch, which is awesome. So um, when you have that, then we can, Cisco customers, or uh, customers who likes ACI, for example, can go deploy Hyper-V uh, workloads and get the policy uh, support and end-to-end -end visibility in that sense. So as long as the choice is provided, I think you're right. You don't necessarily have to create your own versions of it. But I think um, you know every company is different. Right? They don't necessarily want to invest because some vendor wants to do a solution based on that. So they say, okay, at least I give you a choice. You can go create it yourself if you want. I give you the APIs and you go create it yourself. I think those are okay. You know, this is fair, right? Because we can't expect every vendor to, every hypervisor vendor to sit and do work for somebody else. All right, so, so uh, Balaji, uh, you know, when I think about all the administrators coming to this show, um, you know, three quarters of them don't want anything to do with networking. You know, how are we doing as an industry about making it easier for the administrators to get their jobs done? And you know, last point I want to let you take is, you know, you know, what, what can we look forward to? Uh, you know, that, that the users can see, you know, some light at the end of the tunnel to just make their jobs. Yeah, much I think I think the silo is going to go away. I think I, I really don't believe, um, you know, that. Uh, uh, any vendor can survive just for providing one, like storage only, networking only, and, and virtualization or server only. And that's why you see everybody's encroaching into every other space, right? So there's, you know, because the thing is, at the end of the day, people don't have resources to do that kind of silo, and it takes time to put together, six months to put a solution together. So I think that uh, the IT administrator perspective, you should be willing to go and learn different technologies. If you're a VMware admin, 
you need to learn how to know networking and, and storage, and, and, and same vice versa. When I, I used to be a Cisco guy, obviously I used to work in Cisco Tech, so I know CLI very well. But then um, I, 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 and then I started learning uh, Ubuntu. I can install OpenStack today, you know. Um, so those things I have to, you know, upgrade my skills, and I'm sure that um, I, you know people who are attending this show um, has to figure out a way to kind of become this single IT person. All right, well, Balaji, we're all for busting through the silos, helping customers take advantage of the newer technologies that are going to make their lives overall, make businesses more productive overall. Thanks so much for joining us on this segment, and uh, Cube's coverage from VMworld 2014. We'll be right back after this quick break. <laughs>